pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. And I would say by far the best part of having the opportunity to play for Team Canada is the chance to share these experiences with other people in the country. And for us, it was always an approach of pursuing, I think, Olympic standards in whatever we did. And a very common question that we would be asked as members of the Canadian women's hockey team was how do you guys deal with the pressure or the expectations? And as many in this room support the, uh, the sport of ice hockey, when you see the teams competing at the Olympics, what medals do you like the hockey teams to bring back to the country? Gold is usually the expectation. So there are, I would say yes, these high expectations from the country. But for us, we made a conscious choice. And for everyone in this room, it's thinking about the choices that we make on a daily basis. And for us, instead of feeling this huge burden on our shoulders, to feel the pressure or the stress that we have to bring back a gold medal for Canada, we made a conscious choice and we shifted our perspective. And we said, well, it's actually pretty nice that people in this country want to see us perform well. And we saw this as support pushing us along through the demands, through the exhaustion of the training and the preparation. Instead of a burden on our shoulders weighing us down, this was a support to help to guide us through that process. And for everyone, I mean, days are not always perfect or easy, but saying, is this a challenge or is this also an opportunity to rise to this occasion? I know one of the takeaway messages that I took from Harvard University, I had the chance to go to school there and to play hockey there. I took a course called Psychology Applied to Business, and it talked about the difference between perfection and excellence. And there isn't much in life or in school or sport that's absolutely perfect. But the standard of excellence is very attainable. And that was something that really re resonated with me, to think about my life as a person, as a student, as an athlete, as a professional, or as a mother. Right? It's not always perfect. But if we can all strive for the standard of excellence, that's something that was very attainable and a motto of mine to say, I want to pursue excellence in every aspect of my life. To not just be a hockey player, but to think of all of these elements of my life and pursue excellence in every area. I also think at whatever stage of our lives and our careers, it's always about setting those new standards. And for me, I always remember this one day when I was 15 years old and I sat down and I had lunch with my dad one day. Sitting at lunch and my dad asks me, he says, Jen, you know, what's your ultimate dream or your ultimate goal? So at that point, I was a 15-year-old athlete and pretty excited about the chicken sandwich that I'd ordered for lunch, but my dad wanted an answer to this question. And so I thought about it, and I had been that kid, I watched the Olympics on television, and I said, okay, Dad, I said, my ultimate goal is to go to the Olympic Games. I said, I would love, I would love to play hockey for Team Canada at the Olympics. But my next line was, I said, but I don't know if it's possible. And so my dad looked at me across the table that day, and he said, he said, why not you? He said, if somebody else can be there playing hockey for Team Canada at the Olympic Games, he said, why can't it be you? And at first I thought, you know, it's very sweet, Dad, but you clearly have no idea, uh, is what I thought that day. But he repeated it one more time, and he said, why not you? And I thought back to one of my high school coaches, and I went to a school called St. John's Ravens Court uh, in Winnipeg. So I'd gone to a public school, uh, French immersion, until grade eight, and I switched, I went to a private school in Winnipeg from grade eight through grade 12. And one of my high school coaches, we had a theme for the year, and our theme was to never have to say, I wish I would have. Right, that whole idea of having no regrets. So I decided, was I a long shot to make the Olympic team? Absolutely. I'd never been to a camp before. I'd never been ranked in their system before. But I thought back to that high school coach, and I thought to never have to say, I wish I would have. To have no regrets. To do everything that you possibly can to reach that goal or that standard. So I decided I didn't want to watch the Olympics on television and say, oh, you know what? I really wish I would have done something to try to make it there. So Hockey Canada announced for the first Olympic year that they would be selecting a group of 28 girls to train and prepare for the Olympics. 
So I was busy working on every aspect of my development. So I thought about myself in the whole middle of a, a diagram, and then all of the tools that you need to be successful. Skill development, your peak performance training, your nutrition, your recovery, your education, all of those things came into play for me for being the best version of myself. So I was working on all of these elements. 28 girls be selected to be part of the training group and 20 made the final roster. And then, a few weeks later, Hockey Canada made a second announcement. And they said 20 of those 28 spots are already taken. <laughs> I thought, that's a touch unfortunate. Uh, however, there were now thousands of us vying for these eight remaining spots because the girls that had competed at World Championships the year before had earned their spots. So I went to an evaluation camp along with hundreds of others in Calgary and a few weeks later I got a phone call uh, from the head coach of the Olympic roster and she said, Jen, you've been, you've been selected to be part of this training group. So that was exciting but it was only one step. That was the training group. My ultimate goal was to make that final roster. And it was a process in terms of trying to make that Olympic roster of focusing on being the best person that you could be and focusing on what you could control. So every practice, every game, every training session that we had, there were always evaluators there judging our performance. But for us, it was saying, how could we make the people around us better? Here we were competing for the very same spots in the team, but still saying, you know what, I hope that you're good because that means that I need to be even better and embracing that idea of the positive rivalry. And I know for me as an athlete, when I was in the locker room or on the ice or on the bench with Fiona and our other teammates, I always said, I somehow want to make my teammates better because I'm there. So if at the end of this year, I ask myself, how do I want to feel at the end of this Olympic process? And for everybody in this room, you can say, how do I want to feel at the end of this school year or at the end of this season? or in a few years from now. You know, as a parent, or as a coach, or an athlete, or a student, you can ask that question and set those goals for yourself. And for me, I said at the end of the year, I can look back, if I've somehow made this experience better for the people around me, I can feel really proud of myself and have that, that feeling of no regrets. So the coaches could also make releases at any point. So any month, any week, and any day, they could call athletes into the Hockey Canada office and just release them from the Olympic program. So we had no idea when those decisions would be made. Again, focusing on what we could control, our performance being the best that we could be on a daily basis. So I made it through the first few releases and we were down to a group of 23 girls. And this one day in December, as Fiona remembers, they told us our set meeting times that we could each go to meet the coaches and they would let us know if we had made the final Olympic roster or not. I remember waking up that morning, going to the Hockey Canada office and sitting in a waiting chair, and there were two huge doors, and there was a sign above the doors, and it said boardroom. So I was sitting there for a while, my stomach had a little case of the flip-flops, and finally I was told, Jennifer, it's your turn to go in to the boardroom. So I stood up from my chair, I took a deep breath, and I thought, I'm about to find out. So I took another deep breath, and I took a few steps forward, and I opened these two huge boardroom doors. So I opened the doors. False alarm, there was another set of huge boardroom doors. <laughs> so I wasn't there yet, but I took a few more steps forward, and when I opened the second set of doors, the three coaches were at the far end of the room, head coach was in the middle, and she just smiled, and she held out her hand, and she said, congratulations. I'm a little emotional, there may have been a few tears, but it was all very structured at that Hockey Canada boardroom. And we were told that we could make one phone call before we left that boardroom. And I called my parents. So I was 18 years old at the time when I was first told that I would be an Olympic athlete. And I called my parents because the first moment that I thought about when I was told I would be a, an Olympic athlete, first moment that I thought about was that lunch that I had with my dad when I was 15 years old. It's the first thing I thought about. And the advice I was given that day was why not you? So for every person in this room, as I said, whatever phase of life that you're in, sometimes 
it's setting that standard just a little bit higher than you initially think possible. Why not have your best year ahead? Why not do, you know, be a better teammate in the locker room than you've ever been before, even better? Why not have better results at school than you've ever had before? Why not be more engaged and have a higher level of communication with your kids or your athletes than you've ever had before? And for me, it was setting that standard just a bit higher than I initially thought possible. So here's a little feature that was done on my dad and I leading up to the 2010 Olympics. And it talks about how you want to feel in big moments. And at one point, it uses a little saying which I called your ideal performance state. So if you're a professional or if you're a student or an athlete thinking, how do you feel when you perform at your very best? So for an athlete, sometimes they say that's being in the zone. And for me, I said I felt at my best when I played with a free mind and an unburdened heart. That's when I felt at my best. It could be intense and competitive, but there was still a bit of freedom to allow yourself to anticipate, to anticipate, to react, to respond, to communicate, right? So every person here probably has a different description, how you feel when you're at your best, but it's taking the time to think, how can I get there consistently? Not just once in a while, but as consistently as possible. So here's a little feature that was done. It talks about how you want to feel in those big moments. If it's a big game, a big project, a big career opportunity, how do you want to feel in those big moments? So enjoy. Pressure. It can seep into the mind of an Olympic athlete, permeating thoughts and creating self-doubt. Unless, of course, you have perspective. I think sometimes it's a little too common where people take the negative approach and, and get consumed by expectations or pressure um, that they create for themselves or others put on them. Fear, stress, anxiety. But I do think if you look at it and sort of thrive in that situation and say, well, what can I see all the best parts of this? Um, then I think all that pressure starts to dissipate. Few Olympians have the pedigree to deal with pressure quite like Team Canada forward generally. Into the middle, Barrow shoots, scores! Her father, Cal, a sports psychologist, has guided Olympians like Katrina LeMaydon, Susan Ock, and Pierre Luders. His prized pupil has always been his daughter. She definitely kept an eye on what I was doing and the sports that I was working with and people at the Olympic and national and pro level. And she's a pretty astute kind of learner. Encourages people to have that attitude of, of wanting to succeed and um, as opposed to having to do something or having to perform. Um, and I think that's really helped me. When pressure mounts, the mind becomes clouded. But over the years, Cat Jennifer coping mechanisms. I think he just helps me um, remind myself of how I want to feel. I mean, he always finds the right thing to say. I don't think in her whole life and career I've ever sensed when she's performing or playing that it's getting to her. When you think the game is hopeless, there's always more magic. There's always more magic in Jennifer. Barrel ties the game! That magic has propelled Jennifer to a pair of Olympic gold medals. And through it all, she's been buoyed by one of her father's favorite mantras. Playing with a free mind and an unburdened heart. And for me, I just feel like when I'm at my best, um, I'm out on the ice and playing, um, I do. I, Jennifer has visualized playing for gold on February 25th. But if that opportunity arises, what message will Cal have for his daughter? Enjoy every moment. Um, I think he'd say, enjoy the moment, is what I think he'd say. Thank you. So we were training in Calgary at the time. My dad was in Winnipeg, and they said, Jen, you know, you've learned a few things from your dad along the way. But I thought it was you know, the biggest moment of my athletic career at that point, an Olympic gold medal game in Canada on home soil. And I thought of all of the things I'd learned along the way, what would that one piece of advice be? Right, to enjoy it. That idea that everything has prepared you for this moment. So for the athletes to say, even in your young careers, yes, everything has prepared you to have your best season yet. And to approach that with that trust and that belief and to celebrate your teammates that do well. I know my brother played for the Canadian World Junior Hockey Team. He won three gold medals for Canada. Only Canadian to have done so. When Jason was on the ice after winning his third, the media asked him, they said, Jason, you know, what does it feel like to win your third gold medal for Canada? 
And my brother Jason didn't even hesitate. And he said, hands down, he said, it is way better to see the rookies on this team that are having the chance to win their first gold medal for Canada. Right? Far more excited for the guys on the team to experience this for the first time than he was to talk about any records or his own personal success. Right? And I feel like it's about celebrating the people around you. I know I was asked after 2010, Jen, you know, what was your favorite career goal that you scored? And after Vancouver, when I was asked, I said, you know, you know, I don't think it was a goal. You know, it was an assist. And it was being on the ice for our first goal in 2010, the gold medal game. I passed to Marie-Philippe Poulain. We played on the same line at the Olympics. And she scored that first goal in the gold medal game, which ended up being the gold medal winning goal at the Olympics. But for me, it was that assist on setting her up. She had a beautiful shot but setting her up so that my teammate could succeed, which felt even, even better. You know, not every process is perfect. I know when I was playing with Bryden in Calgary, and we were both playing at the High Performance Center in Calgary, and my goal was to make the Olympic team, and at the time I was 17. But the year before that Olympic year, I did not make the under 18 national team for Canada. I remember it was one year away, and I was not named as one of the top 20 players in the under 18 program in Canada. But we have a choice to make. Did I just say, oh, you know what, that's it, there's no chance. But I had a choice to make. Do I have a lot of work to do in one season? Absolutely. But how can I rise to this occasion, to this opportunity, and one year later, after working hard, very hard all season long, I was the one to crack that roster of that final senior Olympic team. So the path isn't always perfect, but adapting along the way. My brother Jason, first round NHL pick, highly touted, you know, was hopeful for a long career in the NHL. He retired after a few seasons of playing professionally because of concussions. He went back to business school at the University of Michigan, got his business degree, and was hired by the Pittsburgh Penguins after he graduated. He worked as assistant general manager for Pittsburgh for 10 years. They won three Stanley Cups. And he's now been in Buffalo as the general manager uh, for the past season and a bit. And they have some work to do, but they're on a six-game winning streak uh, in Buffalo. So, but for him, not necessarily the path that he envisioned, right? But adapting and making the most of the situation and setting new standards for yourself along the way. You know, with the Olympic process, was it comfortable? It was far from comfortable. It was extremely exhausting. But for us, it was adapting along the way and knowing we we're still working towards this vision and this belief. So here's a, a few images uh, from the Olympic process and finding our inspiration. Uh, my mom was an Olympic speed skater, so I was very fortunate that I didn't have to look too far for my inspiration, but there was never any pressure for my brother and I that we had to be hockey players or had to play sports all the time. We had a great level of communication in our family and my parents encouraged us to be healthy and to be active. But it was always our decision on what activities we wanted to be involved with or what schools that we chose to go to. Um, but it was providing us with those decisions. And my parents always used to enjoy that process. Um, I'd done some work for the International Ice Hockey Federation. I know that Kristen's worked uh, with them as well. So it's a little bit dark, but that's a picture of um, the Olympic Oval. And I just had my sneakers on. But this was the Olympic Oval where my mom had actually competed as an Olympic athlete. So for me to get the chance to be on the ice and to somehow follow in her footsteps. So for everyone finding your sources of motivation and inspiration, uh, enjoying the journey. So that's my brother and I uh, playing a little basement hockey in Winnipeg. Uh, but I think Jason has always been an inspiration for me in terms of those standards and how he carried himself uh, at every phase of his life. Uh, the smile through the cage, my parents said as soon as I started playing hockey, they knew it was something pretty special because every time I hit the ice, they could see my smile through the cage. And that was true in every setting. That was the Olympic Village uh, in Vancouver. Our support networks, I always think that's really important. Um, and certainly living in this community, uh, you all have a lot of support networks that want to see you perform well. And those were friends of mine um, that came to watch me play in Vancouver. And I asked them what their favorite part of the Olympics was. And they'd gone to men's hockey games and the curling venue and up in Whistler. And they said, well, Jen, they said it was when you finally found us in the, at the end of the gold medal game. And they were up probably the last row of 20,000 people in the rink. And I finally found them. But they were the reason that I first started playing the game. Um, and it was about enjoying that process. This was right before puck drop uh, for the gold medal game in 2010. And I always remember that feeling because I did have this sense of calm an approach of, you know, no matter what, I believe that I can have an impact today. 
And someone asked me what my favorite career moment was. You know, and it, it was probably that assist, but it was probably the entire gold medal game in 2010. I felt like I had ups and downs in my career in terms of being a rookie, to being having a stronger impact on the team, to playing different roles, to coming back to having the impact that I wanted to. And I remember in 2010, I did, I felt great. And it was an intense game. And I remember looking over at my teammates just on the blue line, and we got on the bench before they started the game. And, we just felt like we were ready, that no matter what, that we could have the impact that we wanted. And right before we went to the rink uh, that year, we had a team meeting. Before we left the village, we had a special guest, and it was Steve Iserman that came into uh, our team meeting. And Steve told us, if I could tell you one thing before you go to the rink, he said, it would just be to trust yourself. He said, I know it's not fancy, but trust yourself, trust your preparation. And for us, we sort of just took that deep breath and said, yeah, you know, everything has prepared us for this moment. There was that smile through the cage celebrating. And this is the, uh, the medal presentation. And I think we had the same feeling uh, from the first year that we won in 02 to the third time that we won uh, when I was on the team in 2010. I remember in 02 uh, was a year of challenges for us in Salt Lake City. And before the Olympics, we played the US team uh, in eight games before Salt Lake City. So this was a long time ago when the, the Olympics were in Salt Lake. But does anyone remember how many times Team Canada beat Team USA before the Salt Lake City Olympics? Out of, or you could take a guess. Four would have been great. Yes, four would have been, it wasn't four, it's less than four. Any other guesses? One? I know, unfortunately somebody up here is correct. Um, we did not beat the US in even one game before the Olympics. So this is certainly an example of the path that isn't always perfect. For some reason, it was a year of challenges for us, and this, you know, we, we lost eight in a row. I remember there was a little bit of public concern within Canada, and media was asking us, what is wrong with you guys? Right? Well, we haven't brought our best yet, but we still believe that we can be successful at the Olympics. And their next question, well, how can you possibly think that? You know, you've just lost eight games in a row. <laughs> Thanks, you guys, but not Kristen. You didn't ask those questions. You asked the nice questions. But some of them were saying, what's wrong? Well, you know, we're going to learn from this. This was not our master plan, right, to lure the Americans into a false sense of confidence before the Olympics. We just faced these challenges, but said, okay, we can learn from this, and we get to the Olympic final, we can be ready. We moved to the Olympic final in Salt Lake City. We felt this is our time to perform. They dropped the puck to start the game, and quite a few penalties were called against Canada and not very many against the Americans. 13 against Canada, two against the Americans in the Olympic gold medal final. I may or may not have had a couple of penalties that game, but we could only control our response. Certain calls were beyond our control, but on the ice and on the bench, we all embraced our roles. And for players that typically had a lot of ice time and played on the power play, we're not seeing any ice time. The majority of the game was spent on the penalty kill. So you had players that typically didn't get as much ice time that were getting all of the ice time in an Olympic gold medal game. But every person on the bench embraced that. And we finally stood on that line. It was similar in Salt Lake City and in Vancouver. But I remember in Salt Lake getting on the ice for the last 30 seconds. We were up by one goal. And I remember just chipping the puck into the neutral zone as the final few seconds just ticked off the clock. And the buzzer sounded. And it was the first time that we ever became Olympic champions. And the moment that we remember is when we're standing on the ice right after the gold medal game. And we all stood in the line, and I wore number 17, so it was a little bit further down that line. And I always remember looking up and looking back, and I could see all of my friends and my teammates that were getting their Olympic gold medals placed around their necks. And that was the best moment, because you knew Every person standing there had somehow helped the person next to them and the person next to them. And whether you played two minutes of that hockey game or 32 minutes of that hockey game, if you were the goaltender on the ice or if you were the goaltender on the bench, we all stood there and received those Olympic gold medals for Canada all together. And it was our backup goaltender that year that had a great line. So Sammy Jo Small, she'd played in a in World Championship Finals, been the most valuable player of the World Championships. And she said she was told the night before she wouldn't be playing the gold medal game. And she said, I knew I had a choice to make. Um, and she said, I knew that my team needed me. And she said, who knew 
that I had trained my entire life as a competitive athlete, she said, to be the very best cheerleader that I could possibly be on gold medal game day. But she said, that's what my team needed. And she was, with every penalty that we received during that game, she was the first one there to pick us up and to give hints to our forwards on where to score. It was, she was talking a lot to Jaina Hefford. And Jaina Hefford ended up scoring the gold medal winning goal in Salt Lake City. And it was our backup goaltender on the bench, Sammy Joe, that was giving her hints on where to score on the US goaltender. So we said, you know, Sammy's line was, she said, you can't always choose your role, but you can choose how you play it. So for whatever that role is, make the most of that opportunity. And I do believe from Salt Lake City to Torino, Italy, to Vancouver 2010, to the team that went on and won gold in Sochi as well, it was embracing that role and saying, what can I do to make the most of this role to embrace that team approach? Uh, there's the medal presentation when I said it was fun to, to stand on that line and when they finally got down to number 17. But to see our anthem uh, being played in Vancouver, uh, we saw the, the men's final game, it was a couple days after ours, and we were sitting next to members of the Canadian Olympic Committee. And we, the, in 2010, it was Crosby who scored that classic storybook goal to end uh, the Vancouver Olympics. And we were sitting next to the Olympic Committee, and they said, as soon as Crosby scored that overtime winner, as soon as that puck went in the net, that they just wished and they hoped that every single Canadian felt like they had an assist on that goal. Right? That's what they wanted, every person to feel like they were a part of that. Uh, that was me finding my parents uh, along the way, and I think, you know, for us, it's thinking, what emotions work best for us? Gratitude was a really big one for me, and I said, I always took moments of appreciation. And for me, when I was walking from my classes at Harvard, I had to cross a bridge to go to the athletic facilities. And it was busy and demanding trying to juggle classes at Harvard, playing on Team Canada, going to training camps, playing for Harvard University. But I always took a little deep breath and a moment of appreciation when I crossed that bridge to say, yes, it's busy, life is busy, but this is exactly where we want to be and to make the most of every day um, that we have. You know, it was Alex Bilodeau who won a gold medal in Vancouver, first Canadian to ever win an Olympic gold medal on home soil, repeated his performance in Sochi. And a couple of things, we tend to remember Bilodeau when he's at the end of his competition, who's the first person he goes to see at the bottom of the mountain. His, I heard somebody say his brother. He's the first one that he went to. For him, by far the priority, get to his brother immediately. And he also said, um, after the Olympics, someone asked him, he said, Alex, we noticed you're at the top of the mountain. And we noticed before you compete, you take this little piece of paper out of your pocket. Can we ask you what you're looking at? And he said, sure. He says, I take out this piece of paper before my biggest competitions. And he said, I look at this because there are three columns on this piece of paper. He said, small column on the left, small column on the right, and a huge open space in the, middle, in the middle column. And he says, I look at this before my competitions. He says, I always take a deep breath to appreciate the crowd, he said, and then I look at this piece of paper, and he said, because the small column on the left is the past, he said, small column on the right is the future, but what he looks at is that huge open space in the middle of that paper that reminds him of the present moment, and that's what he was focused on, that middle section. To not think about how demanding or exhausting it had been to get to that point, and to not think about the consequences. If this goes well, it doesn't go well. If I'm the first Canadian to win Olympic gold medal on home soil or not, no, he just saw this as an opportunity to perform well. So of course, important to have our vision, but it's important to make the most of every day that we have on the people that we're surrounded by and the choices that we make. I've always been thankful for my parents. They've been a huge support network uh, celebrating our success. We had the chance to go back to Vancouver and celebrate. I had the pleasure and the privilege to celebrate with the Queen of England uh, as well. I was invited to a lunch. I thought thousands of people will be there. I'd love to attend. I show up at the reception uh, at the beginning and we are given our seating assignments. I say, Jennifer, uh, you will be sitting at a round table of eight with the Queen of England. I said, quick, where is the etiquette course before I head in there? But she was lovely, asked all kinds of questions about sport. Uh, she was amazing, but if you think about, in terms of consistency, in terms of her years, in terms of the public eye, uh, she's incredible in terms of the longevity of her career uh, and the legacy that she's leaving. Uh, setting new standards. I had the chance to broadcast in, Sh in Sochi. Again, adapting to change. We, we were told we'd be doing about one hockey game a day, men's or women's. Upon arriving in Sochi, we were given a new schedule where we were typically covering three games a day, women's and men's games. I thought I was doing reporting roles. I was then told I would be between the benches for the men's hockey games. And in Sochi, there, were no, there, were, there was no glass 
between the benches on the ice. So, I mean, hey, you know what, let's, we're here, let's just make the most of it. I definitely had to be on and focused, but setting new standards, this is John Anderson, one of the best camera guys in the hockey business, works the NHL playoffs, the Stanley Cup finals, and I had the privilege to work with him uh, at the Olympic Games. I think um, in terms of standards of excellence and being the best person that you can be, I think that's what it was about with Team Canada and certainly this culture uh, in Halifax and Nova Scotia. But Ron McLean, he's pretty recognizable in this country in terms of sports broadcasting. And Ron has time for everyone. I've done a number of projects with Ron McLean, and he gets approached quite regularly for a handshake, for an autograph, for a story, for a conversation. And I have never seen Ron say no to anyone, whether it's at a hockey rink, an airport, a restaurant, a broadcasting booth. He makes time for every single person. And if he needs to run to go and be on the air, he said, just wait right here. I'll be back, whatever, in 10 or 15 minutes when I'm done this segment and I'll make sure I sign that, that card for you, whatever it is. And for every guest that Ron has for any show, if that guest brings up a story, Ron McLean probably has 37 other stories connected to that guest. He has a great memory, but he also prepares himself for those moments and for those guests. He works very hard so that in that situation, he can relax and prepare and perform. Um, so that was key for him, being a great person. Those are some examples from Sochi. Cassie Campbell Pascal, I had the chance to play with her for many years and do some broadcasting and work with her. Um, this is uh, my family, so my brother's uh, um, on the left. This is important because of our support networks and appreciating the environment that we're in, both personally and professionally, athletically, academically. So my dad was inducted to the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame last year. So it was a whole weekend of celebration. But my dad's favorite part from the entire weekend was that there's a wall where all of the inductees had signed. So my mom was inducted 15 years ago. And my dad's favorite part from the entire weekend was that he found the spot on the wall that my mom had signed 15 years ago. And my dad signed probably the smallest autograph I have ever seen anyone sign just so he could sign his name right next to where my mom had signed the wall 15 years ago. And for him, that's what was most fulfilling for him, to show his appreciation for my mom, his wife. Right, so for people here to appreciate your teammates, your friends, your family, your parents, your coaches, your, teacher, your teachers, your colleagues, and I think that for me, gratitude um, and appreciation and, and understanding the value of our support networks is very important. Uh, enjoying the process along the way, that was me getting on the ice with my husband Adrian uh, when I was still competing and, and it was just, for that, that was a reminder of, of enjoying the process. Uh, my daughter Maya, who's now three, it's, I think a reminder on time management, uh, her little sister who's just over one, and not every day that I get to be out playing in the snow with her, but um, she does have a pair of ice skates, this is her friend uh, Kenzie, so Maya's on the right, so Kenzie is actually Sammy Joe, the goaltender I was telling you about, so Sammy Joe's daughter is Kenzie on the left. Um, but for them, no pressure, but she does seem to like to skate along with her gymnastics classes. But I talk about time management, and for certainly the student athletes here to focus on time management. You may have to make different choices than other friends do, but to enjoy that process. I know for me, whether it was high school or Harvard, they say maybe I don't have as much time to write this paper, but make, let's make sure that I make these next three hours the most productive that they can be. Um, so here's a little, I want to show you guys a few clips from Sochi. And I think there were some great examples in Sochi of being a great person. And it wasn't just about being a great athlete or your results in the competition, but it was focusing on the process and the choices that you were making. I thought another great example from the Summer Olympics, is I remember a 16-year-old Canadian swimmer in Rio who performed very well. Anyone remember her name? Alexiak, very good. Did anyone remember see her swimming? At the end, as swimmers, you race and then you touch the wall and you have to turn around to see your results on the wall. Does anyone remember how long it took Penny to turn around to look at the wall to see her results? It took her a long time. She just touched the wall and she had a big, long pause in the pool and it took her a number of seconds before she finally turned around to see her results. And she won. She won an Olympic gold medal. But she was so focused on her performance and her skill and then the outcomes took care of themselves, right? Just focusing on your skill every step at a time. You know, embracing the competition. 
Another example from, from Rio, does anyone remember a great Canadian sprinter who did really well in Rio? Andre de Grasse. Did anyone see any video or, f or photos of de Grasse competing against one of the highest profile athletes that ever competed at the, the, that, the Summer Olympics? Who did he compete against in the sprint, in the 100 meter sprint? Bolt. Do you guys remember what happened when they were about to cross the finish line? Does anyone see photos? They're about to cross the highest profile event at the Olympic Games, and they're about to cross the finish line in both the semifinal and the final. And what do they have? This giant smile on their face. Like, this is amazing, right? I mean, here, like I said, highest profile event at the Olympics. And they're just saying, you know what? This is great that you're good, because I have to be even better, right? So in Sochi, there was great moments. There was a cross-country ski coach in Canada, had extra equipment for his athletes. Russian athlete came by before the Canadians with broken gear. Canadian coach went over immediately. He said no words were exchanged because we didn't speak the same language, but he said I knew there was an athlete in need. And someone said, well, why did you make that call? Your athletes hadn't even come by yet. Canadian coach says, well, I knew there was an athlete in need, he said, and I wanted to allow that athlete to finish his race with dignity. Right? That was the choice the Canadian coach ma made. Um, Gilmore Junio was a Canadian long track speed skater, qualified for the Olympic Games, sees his teammate performing so well in practice. He decides he wants to give up his spot in the Olympics so his teammate can race in his spot. Morrison Skates wins a silver medal for Canada. But in every interview, they talk about that being a team success story. Women's hockey in Sochi, just before I queue it up, does anyone remember what happened in Sochi? Canada was down 2 nothing, with a few minutes left in the game, looking like they didn't have a chance of getting back into it. But before they went out for the third period, they looked at a letter in their locker room. And it was a letter from the bobsled team of Kaylee Humphreys and Heather Moyes. And they had come from behind in their final race of the bobsled competition to win the gold medal. And it said to the women's hockey team, we are living proof that every moment matters, is what the letter said. Women's hockey looks at this letter before the third. A few minutes left to go in the game, Canada gets one goal. Then they pull their goaltender, which is over a minute left in the game, and the U.S. has the chance to seal the victory. The U.S. sends the puck down towards the em Canada's empty net. Does anyone remember what happened in Sochi? To the post. Canada came back, gets the tying goal in the last minute of the game, and they go in their locker room before overtime, and they look at this letter, every moment matters. They come out and they win the game in overtime. They wrote a second letter, it said to the men's hockey team. We're another example that every moment matters. <laughs> men's hockey team put this in the locker room and they won the gold medal. Uh, but it does, every moment matters and having that constant belief. Here's some highlights from the Sochi Games of 2014, enjoy.
Okay, there we go, some highlights from Sochi. Now, some of you had the chance to look at the medals uh, before dinner. It's a really neat story from Vancouver, and they gave us these carrying cases for the medals, and inside the carrying case, they gave us uh, these beautiful scarves. And for some of you that are a bit closer, can you see how there's a pattern on the scarf? So that some of you that saw the medals may have noticed that these are the gold medals that we won in 2010, that there is a pattern on the front of the medal. So all of us that won a gold medal in 2010 in Vancouver, we all have a unique medal. They're all different and they all fit together like pieces of the puzzle. It talks about how very important every single person is. Uh, so for us, uh, for everyone to think about the path that you're on and that many of us are surrounded by people on a daily basis. And when I returned from Vancouver, I went to Winnipeg where I grew up and there was a celebration luncheon. And just as the event was wrapping up, I was on my way out the door and I had a little tap on my shoulder. So I turned around and a nice lady was there and she was a mother and she started telling me that her and her six-year-old daughter had watched our gold medal game on television. And she said at the end of the game, we stood up in our living room, she said, we sang the Canadian anthem with you guys, we had tears in our eyes. And I told her, I said, thank you. You know, that's what makes this, this experience so special for us. But she kept going, and she said the day after the gold medal game, they went to the outdoor rink. So Winnipeg, the winters are a little refreshing, so there are a few outdoor rinks. Six-year-old girl, I guess she put on all of her gear, and she tied up her skates, and she hit the outdoor rink. And as soon as she got on the ice, she just started throwing her gloves and her stick up in the air repeatedly. Her mom says, what are you doing? I guess, and the six-year-old girl, like she turned around and she looked up at her mom and she says, I'm just practicing. She said, I'm just practicing my celebration, is what she said that day. But it was a reminder that we are often surrounded by people. So your choices, your actions, and your behaviors can always help yourself, but they have the potential to impact the people around you as well. So enjoy that privilege. Um, I'll just wrap up. I have a feature that was done uh, for the Vancouver Olympics, and I thought this was important, certainly for the student athletes, that it's not just about those big moments and those big final games, but it's the lead up time um, and all the hard work that goes into it. So this is some clips of the training and the preparation that led up to the Olympic gold medal game uh, and the excitement and anticipation of 2010. The International Olympic Committee has the honor of announcing that the 21st Olympic Winter Games in 2010 are awarded to the city of Vancouver.
My last comment before Kristen comes up is just in terms of encouragement about resiliency. And when I see the footage from Vancouver, uh, for me, I'm filled with gratitude for these experiences. But I also think of the tough moments when, as I mentioned, I didn't make that under 18 national team. Or in 2006, when my goal was to be the very, or one of the top three players in the world, one of the best women's hockey players in the world. And halfway through that Olympic year, being told by the Olympic coaches that I was on the bubble which meant they weren't sure if I was going to make Team Canada or not. But turning that around, and by the Olympics in 26, getting back to playing on one of the top two lines and contributing the way that I wanted to. But I think of those moments that weren't easy, that weren't tough, but still believing in yourself. So the path may not be perfect, but having that trust, and when I see those highlights from Vancouver, again, a year that was full of ups and downs, but in that moment, and seeing those highlights, it still makes me smile. So thinking that we all have that potential to be resilient in whatever field of life and whatever phase of life we might be in. So enjoy that process. Again, thank you for the opportunity to share in the evening and enjoy your path ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you.